Good morning all. Good morning. Oh, it's lovely to see so many of you out at Coastline this morning. Welcome. If this is your first time here, it is lovely to see you. Uh, and if you're a regular, it is also lovely to see you guys and everyone in between. Shall we pray first this morning? Sure. Loving God, we thank you this morning for who you are. That you come with us this morning to our service. That you are here in the middle. That you are ready to receive our worship. And you encourage each of us to come this morning with worshiping hearts. So Father, this morning we pray that you would um, take away any distractions. The things that take our focus in the outside world would be put to one side. And that our sole focus and attention would be placed on you. And that we would be able to look at you with the eye of faith. So Father, this morning, be with us as we open your word, as we sing your praises. And we ask that you would give us hearts able to receive the message that you have personally for each and every one of us. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let me read to you. I'm going to read this one from Psalm 34. Psalm 34. You can follow along if you like. I'm going to start reading the verse 1. Psalm 34. I will praise the Lord at all times. I will constantly speak His praises. I will boast only in the Lord. Let all who are helpless take heart. Come, let us tell of the Lord's greatness. Let us exalt his name together. I prayed to the Lord, and he answered me. He freed me from all my fears. Those who look, on, uh, look to him for help will be radiant with joy. No shadow of shame will darken their faces. In my desperation, I prayed, and the Lord listened. He saved me from all my troubles, for the angel of the Lord is a guard. He surrounds and defends all who fear him. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, the joys of those who take refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you, his godly people. For those who fear him will have all they need. Even strong young lions sometimes go hungry. But those who trust in the Lord will lack no good thing. Come, my children, and listen to me. And I will teach you to fear the Lord. Does anyone want to live a life that is long and prosperous? Then keep your tongue from speaking evil and your lips from telling lies. Turn away from evil and do good. Search for peace and work to maintain it. Amen. Why don't we turn to each other uh, and say good morning and welcome? <laughs> bits and pieces of notices this morning before we uh, sing our first uh, hymn. Um, on today we have uh, our uh, service here, and if you've not been to our service here, this will last about an hour or so, in a wee while the Sunday school will go out, and afterwards um, we'll head through to the cafe uh, to share some tea, coffee, uh, and fellowship together. So if you want to join us for that, um, you'd be more than welcome to join us in the cafe after the service. Um, cafe Church is tonight, and it starts once again, um, so this is the first time we've been able to do Cafe Church in two and a half years, so 
come along to Cafe Church, 7 o'clock, we'll be in the cafe, unless you all turn up, in which case we'll be in here. Um, but that's not a problem, so do turn up. Um, and we'll have uh, a wee time together, just getting back into the way of uh, having Cafe Church. It's going to be lovely to be able to do it once again as we go through uh, the Bible. Um, so come along tonight, Cafe Church, uh, here at 7 o'clock. Um, what else have I got for you? Uh, anyone here? Are you guys back on? Yes. yes. Fantastic. Back on. So the coastline music group uh, or guitar group or whatever is back uh, this week after a couple of weeks uh, break. So if you want to head along to uh, the music group and um, to play musical instruments, to sing or just to have a cup of coffee and a play, then head it along. Mm -hmm. uh, Bob and the team will be there 7 o'clock on Monday. <coughs> Um, Tuesday we have our craft group um, on as usual each and every Tuesday so come along to, uh, 2 o'clock on Tuesday uh, to the craft group um, for all sorts of crafts as well as tea and coffee and a leather as well so that's Tuesday. Um, Wednesday this week um, we have our midweek uh, Sunday school starting back up after the holidays so if you know so, uh, some young people, some children who go to Pitt Main Primary School uh, then tell them about this uh, wee Sunday school group. Um, we pick them up straight from Pitmain Primary School. We bring them back to Coastline at 3 o'clock. Um, we give them some juice uh, and some biscuits and then we do all sorts of crafts and songs and stories and all that kind of stuff um, for an hour or so. Uh, so if you know any uh, folk that go to Pitmain Primary School, then let them know. Uh, and we're there uh, each and every Wednesday uh, up until Christmas. So. Um, that's the midweek Sunday school stuff back. Um, what else do I have for you? Friday, uh, Friendship Club is in Pitmain. Oh, sorry, Wednesday also prayer meeting. Um, prayer meeting this week, 7 o'clock uh, here and in the cafe uh, for the prayer meeting. So please do join us for that. Uh, Friday is the Friendship Club. It's in Crail this week. Uh, once again, I, do I have any suits? I need two suits, I think. Uh, Sandra, thank you. And Jill, thank you. That is brilliant. Uh, thank you very much. I, I know I say it every week and you will be bored of hearing it, but thank you so much to those who do support the Friendship Clubs. We could not, if this was left to me and Daniel to actually organise and make soup for, it would be quite a disaster. So thank you for all of you who make soup uh, and who pray for the Friendship Club and support it just with your presence. Um, having so many people at Crail last week, or two weeks ago, and so many people at Pitween last week, it's just lovely to see people getting back together and sharing some fr uh, fellowship together uh, as well as uh, soup and teas and coffees as well. So keep the Friendship Club uh, in your prayers and keep supporting it practically if you can as well. What else do I have for you? Members, uh, next Sunday is the last Sunday um, for your deacons election slips. Um, we are at a point where we're uh, selecting some new deacons um, and I know we've been, kind of been saying this for the last few weeks um, but we're now at the point where next week is the last week for you to get your um, nominations um, for uh, deacons in. It needs to be in by next Sunday uh, to him so if you could get them in that would be fantastic. Please do continue even after um, your forms are in to pray um, about the deacons elections. Um, so that we can get a, the right number of deacons in place but also the right people that God has for us so um, please keep that in your prayers so that's the deacons elections and um, get your forms in um, I'm going to do shoe boxes right now before I forget <laughs> I'm with you Jody, don't worry um, shoe boxes, you'll see that there is a pile as you go out the door there, there is a pile on the windowsill um, this windowsill nearest us are ones that you can uh, take away uh, if you donate a wee pound to us, um, you can take those shoe boxes away and fill them. And on the opposite window cell, uh, on the other side of the door, is the ones that have already been returned. Um, so these are shoe boxes that have already been filled. Um, Jodie will check them uh, before they go away to Blythewood. So we have until the 6th of November, so we are, we are actually getting quite near the time for the shoe boxes to go away. Um, so if you, you're thinking that you're going to do a shoe box, um, then please do so. Uh, within the next few weeks so that we can get them all packed up and ready for the 6th of November to go on the Blythewood lorry. Um, all of the presents will then uh, head off 
uh, to the Blythe Food Centre where they'll be checked and then they'll be off to Eastern Europe in time for Christmas. So, shoe boxes. Um, what else do we have? We have um, a deacons meeting on uh, Tuesday. It's Tuesday at 7 o'clock. And I think that's it. No? First of November, sorry, the following Tuesday. Following Tuesday. That's next week. Aye. No other bits and pieces that anybody wants to shout at me about? Ah, oh, that's good, that's right. Perfect. We shall move on then and we shall have our first uh, song of today. We've got all our projectors up and running still, which is fantastic. Um, so let's join together, rising if we can, to sing our first song.
blow you, folks. <laughs> How many of you have ever been on the London Underground? Quite a few years. How many have ever tried to navigate the London Underground without a map? It's not easy, is it? Tonight's Catholic Church is giving you an underground map of the whole Bible. What we're doing over the next couple of weeks is looking at how the whole Bible fits together in broad strokes. So when you read Genesis, you know what's going to happen in Matthew. When you read Matthew, you know why the roots of the Old Testament are important. So that starts 7 o'clock tonight. So come along and get your underground map. We're going to have it in the next couple of weeks live in January and February. It'll be tea, coffee, and I need to go to the court now this afternoon to get the sticky bones for all the way. Uh, so we'll do that, so do come along. Sunday school, you guys are free to go, and the rest of you turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. As we continue our theme, our series in Corinthians, we arrive today at a pivotal chapter, chapter 4. Paul really concludes some of his arguments he's been building up with 1, 2, and 3. And then changes the tone going into the rest of the letter. A person should think of us in this way. As servants of Christ and managers of the mysteries of God. In this regard it is required that managers be found faithful. It is of little importance to me that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I don't even judge myself. I am not conscious of anything against myself, but I am not justified by this. It is the Lord who judges me. So don't judge anything prematurely before the Lord comes, who will bring to light what is hidden in darkness, and reveal the intentions of the heart. And then praise will come to each one from God himself. My brothers and sisters, I have applied these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, so that you may learn from us the meaning of the saying, Go beyond nothing which is written. The purpose is that none of you will be arrogant, favouring one person over another, for who makes you so superior? What did you have that you didn't receive? If in fact you did receive it, why do you boast as if you haven't received it? You're already full. You're already rich. You've begun to reign as kings without us, and I wish to God you did reign so we could reign with you. And yet God has displayed us the apostles. In the last place, like men condemned to die, we have become a spectacle to the world, the angels and the people. We are fools for Christ. You are wise in Christ, we are weak, you are strong. You are distinguished, we are dishonored up to the present hour. We are both hungry and thirsty, poorly clothed, roughly treated, homeless. We labor working with our hands. When we revive, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure it. When we are slandered, we respond graciously. Even now we are like the scum of the earth, like everyone's garbage. But I'm not writing this to shame you. But to warn you as my dear children. <clears throat> you have countless instructors in Christ, but you don't have many fathers. For I have become your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Therefore, I urge you to imitate me. This is why I have sent Timothy to you. He's my dearly beloved child and faithful in the Lord. He will remind you about my ways in Christ Jesus, just as I teach everywhere in every church. Now some are arrogant, so I were not coming to you, but I will come to you soon, if the Lord will. And I will find out not the talk, but the power of those who are arrogant. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of fear and words, but of power. What do you want? Should I come to you with a rod or in love with the spirit of gentleness? This is the word of the Lord. Be Let us pray to God. Lord, an unusual passage, but it's in your living and active word. And your word speaks to us today through the power of your Holy Spirit. So as we sing our next song and worship and praise to you, may you settle our hearts. And may we hear, as always, not from the preacher. As Paul reminds us, we are nothing. But may we hear from God himself. Not because we are arrogant. Not because we claim divinity. 
because you speak through your word by the power of your Holy Spirit to your people. So Holy Spirit, come this morning, help the preacher to preach clearly and effectively. And help us as your people to hear what you're saying to us through your word. We ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen. Please stand up your able as we sing our next song, Jesus, Jesus, Holy and Anointed One. <coughs> Call an American. I was like, any American? Call American? 
we've all had conversations like that, haven't we, where we just don't hear what the person's saying. The first three chapters of Corinthians are like that. Paul came to Corinth, I mean, picture the scene, Paul came down from the mountain over Corinth, the Isthmus over, or the, the, the Acre of Corinth, into this big city. And Corinth had never seen or heard anybody like the Apostle Paul before. And Paul wasn't much to look at. Paul, it comes down to history, church history, Paul was bow-legged, he had a hooked nose, he was balding, and he generally wasn't much to look at. And this wee man hobbles up the high street of Corinth. He walks past the Necks and the H&M and the Marks and Spencer, and I'm sure even Corinth had an Aldi as well. And he walks into the marketplace. And in this city which is full of imperial Romans and worship to Caesar, a city built in might and power, of armies and financials, a bit like London or Paris or New York, all rolled into one. And this city he comes and he says, there's a new king in town. There's a saviour who has come to the world from God himself, from Yahweh, the God of the Israelis, has given the world salvation. And he's called Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now straight away, if you're in the ancient world, your, your alarm bell starts going off. How can God be crucified? How can a conqueror be crucified? But God raised him from the dead. We know what Paul preached. The gospel. The good news which he outlines in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 which we'll get to in January time. This is the good news that Christ Jesus came and died for our sins, was crucified and on the third day rose again. And that changes everything. Everything. And the amazing thing was in this city full of people who had never heard talk like this before a power started working in their lives. As the Holy Spirit of God went out from Paul's preaching he transformed lives. He brought people to Jesus. The third person of the Godhead. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Father sent the Son to earn us our salvation, to save us and to bring us back to Him. And the Father and the Son send the Holy Spirit to apply it to our hearts. And that's why Paul said what well, Corinthians, when we looked at it a few weeks back, I came not with human wisdom, not with human elegance, not with PowerPoints and flashy displays and YouTube clips, not that these things are bad, but I didn't come with them. I came with a demonstration of preaching the power of the Holy Spirit to apply Jesus Christ to you. As he said to the Galatians, I present it publicly Christ Jesus and him crucified before your very eyes. And his power rested not in his rhetorical skills, nor in the fact that he was a renowned preacher or prophet, but in the fact that God used him. And this church started growing. And people started coming and things started happening. Miracles, people were healed. The blind were given sight. All this started occurring in this new church. But then something happened. They stopped listening. They started to hear what they wanted to hear. And they started assessing the church and Paul and the apostles like they would do politicians in Westminster. Did you ever, when I was a kid, because my parents got divorced, that would get me at certain times. And sometimes he would take me to the cinema in the afternoon. Now that was great as a kid, I loved going to the cinema in the afternoon. But if you're being in the cinema in the afternoon and you, you're absorbed in it and then you walk out the doors in the daylight, it's a shock, isn't it? It's not just me. Or it's a winter, the morning's getting really dark. Don't forget the clocks go back an hour next week. The clocks go back an hour next week. If you're late for church, we'll know about it. I mean, you turn the light on in the morning now with the darkness around, it sort of dazzles you at first, doesn't it? That's what the Corinthians have experienced. Before Paul, before Jesus, they were dwelling in darkness. I love that passage in Isaiah, don't you? Isaiah chapter 9. The people dwelling in deep, gloomy darkness have saw a great light. When Jesus came into their lives, it was light, it was life, it was joy. I know the church works very hard to make Jesus seem very dull, but he really isn't. He brings life and joy and peace and wholeness and power of the Holy Spirit. The Corinthians had been taken out of the dark sin and brought into the glorious light of God's kingdom and they were dazzled, they were confused. And in their confusion and in their dazzling they basically covered their eyes again because they liked the darkness. Now if you've got a room full of people with their eyes closed, what happens when they start moving around? Run into each other. Run into each other and then the Victoria area gets covered. And so the conflict started, the confusion started, they tried to assess this new situation in their old way. And that's why Paul in verses 1 to verses 5 here says, Guys, you cannot judge me. 
the way you used to. You cannot judge God's mysterious working the way he does things by the world's standards because God doesn't work that way. Remember that your salvation came about by a saviour who was crucified on a Roman cross. Remember that? Remember we talked about that, the wisdom of the world versus the wisdom of God and how they're completely different? The Roman Emperor, when they set out to conquer a city, would not let the Emperor be crucified for the city. That's not how they do things. They came in power and might and crushed the people. Yet when God came to conquer the world through the love of his impeccable, beautiful, glorious Son, he sent them to a cross to die. He stripped them of all equality with God, though he was still fully divine. And he humbled them to the point of a servant to obedience to death and a cross witness to. And yet in that moment of supreme and seeming weakness, God saved the world. Calvary was the pivot on which all of history would turn, and three days later, as Jesus walked out of that tomb, vindicated and alive forevermore by the power of the Holy Spirit. God's new creation, God's reconciliation, God's making this world right. <laughs> Human wisdom from the God. And Paul says, and Paul says to you this morning, friends, do not judge God by human standards or by how he works. God is mysterious. His wonders to be no, of him, don't we? We quote it often. God's mysterious, he works in wonders ways. It works in mysterious ways as wonders to perform. He plants his feet upon the sea and rides out the storm. Behind a frowning providence, there hides a smiling face. Do you know Glasgow Airport's one of the most depressing places in the world? Sorry to Glasgow for that. I mean, if you're building an airport for people, don't make it grey in a city that gets a lot of rain and mist and fog. Last year I had to go through Glasgow Airport in one of those days. And it was a dream, dream day. And you know what it's like, you're down here, you see the rain falling and it's grey. And it's just, it's just not good for Glasgow tourist board. Sorry to Glasgow. You've got many nice things in your city, the airport's not all and I always love it when you taxi along the runway and you go through the wind and the rain and you go up through the crowd, cloud there and as you go through the cloud there, what happens? Yes. You rise up and, what? Yes. The flare off the set of flares, John Sir Hanson. Just going to worry there. It rises up through the cloudy level and you come into beautiful glowing sunshine. That's what that hymn writer meant. God loves us. God loved the church of Corinth. God loved the Apostle Paul. But what he was telling them was, don't judge me by the rain and the ground. Judge me by what I've shown you through the cross of Jesus Christ. That is the greatest proof of my love. If you're going through difficulty in your life, you feel the dream and the gloom. Remember that all things work together for those who are called by my name, who love me, to conform them into the likeness of myself. Don't judge prematurely before the Lord comes. Who will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and reveal the intentions of the heart. This is also a call not to judge the apostle or anyone else in the church. We are a mystery, aren't we? Have a good look at each other there. Oh, I'll turn around and have a good look at each other there. It's not you from falling asleep. Who can fathom the depths of the person beside you? You got <laughs> Careful, John, to make it a dump there. <laughs> We're all mysterious, aren't we? We're all a mixture of wonderful intentions and motivations, and, and who knows ourselves? Sometimes we even know ourselves. Paul says, "Then how can you pass judgment on others? How can you assess others by human standards?" He goes on then in chapter six to really outline this. He, he he writes with sarcasm. Paul talks about how the apostles' ministry must look to the Corinthians. The Corinthians were used to powerful rhetoric. They were used to guys like Cicero coming and preaching his great speeches. They were used to pomp and circumstance. They were used to teachers traipsing in with flunkies behind them and big robes and stuff. And here Paul rocks up, a wee man from Israel who's about that height and makes his own tenants. Who makes you so superior? What do you have that you didn't receive? In fact, if you did receive it, why do you boast as if you hadn't received it? You're rich, you're full, you have everything. Would to God that you were, but we're weak. 
Up to this present hour, we're hungry and thirsty, we're poorly clothed, we're roughly treated, homeless, we labor, working with our hands, we're revived. We're a spectacle to the world. And yet, even by being spectacles, God is working through us. It's funny if you read 1 or 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul, again, I don't know if it's just the way it happens, it's the Holy Spirit reads it, talks about treasure in jars of clay. I love going, don't tell all of us because she'll make me go more often, but I love going to Ikea. I really do. <laughs> I love the food court festival, that's the best part of Ikea. But yeah, Ikea amazes me, it amazes me how those crafty Swedes manage to, to make something and sell it for a pound, it's not great. Well, nowadays with the budget, it's probably one pound twenty. But uh, and these things you buy from IKEA for a pound, these wee things, they don't usually last long, do they? They break or they fall apart or the cat knocks them over, and that's the end of it. Are you? Imagine what's the most expensive tell me, but what's the most expensive thing you own? Think about it. The most expensive thing you own, something material, and your charge is storing it inside something from IKEA that costs a pound. What do you think people are going to think of you? Imagine this beautiful gold ring and you've got it beside a wee sort of clay pot from Ikea for a pound. Look at my beautiful clay pot, isn't it lovely? Yes, by the looks on your faces this morning, you're not sick of the same thing I am. Paul says we're clay pots. The apostles have seen the risen Christ. They've walked with him, they've talked with him, they've fellowship with him. He has commissioned the boy to give the gospel to the whole world, and in them he has put an unsurpassable treasure, the Holy Spirit, Christ himself. And to the world they look weak. To the world they look pitiful. But in them is a strength and a power that the world cannot understand. That the world cannot count with. That has to be seen through the eyes of fear. Look at the end of verse 12 there. When we are reviled, we bless people. When we are persecuted, we endure. When we are slandered, well, that's a hard was it? Nobody likes their name being slandered. Nobody likes mistruth being said about them. When we are slandered, we respond graciously. The world had never encountered something like this. We're used to it nowadays because our society has been shaped by Christian values. I mean, I love, if it wasn't so serious, it would be funny in some ways, but I love watching to see all the carry-ons at Westminster at the minute. And I mean, they all know they have to pretend that they don't want to be Prime Minister, don't they? Oh, that's not my ambition to be Prime Minister. Of course it is. You've spent your whole life thirsting for it. Just be honest and tell us. But they know they have to appear humble and gracious. Do you remember that scene in Yes, Prime Minister, where the, the civil servants are coaching him before he become Prime Minister? Go, Never at any point say you want to be Prime Minister. I say, well, if my friends ask me, and my country needs me, I shall, I shall serve. Ah, for the world's <laughs> But in the Roman world, it wasn't shaped by Christian culture. The emperor ruled by strength and might. There was no, there was no backwards or forwards about it. Augustus, the longest serving emperor, had bumped off his brother in law to get the job. So they were used to if somebody hurt you, you hurt them back. If somebody revived you, you didn't bless them, you punched them in the nose. If somebody was persecuting you, you did something about it. And if somebody slandered you, oh boy. But the Christian faith isn't like that. The kingdom of God is not like that. The kingdom of God is shaped by Jesus. And that's why Paul says in verses 1 to 5 there, you can't judge us by the world's standards because God's wisdom is greater than the world's wisdom. How we live the Christian life is countercultural, it's different. That's why we're salt and life. The spirit within us will act in ways completely contrary to the world. In Corinthians, you need to stop boasting and carry on about it because that's not the way of Christ. You boast as if you received everything already. You can see them strutting up and down the streets. Oh, well, we're great, we're Christians. No, we haven't got it at all. If you realize that you're saved by an amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like you. Corinthians, 
You were an orphan. But Jesus Christ made you everything. You were lost in sin, but no hope of salvation. And Jesus came into your darkness and set you free. Long your imprisoned spirit lay, Corinthians fast bound in sin and nature's light, until his eye diffused a quickening red. And then you rose, your hearts were free. <coughs> That's how God works. When we are weak, He is strong. His grace is more than sufficient for us. It is a power that upholds these clay pots. I'm sure Paul felt it when he was alive. I'm sure Paul felt it when he was persecuted. When he was slandered, it must have cut his soul. And yet, he knows he needs to be like Jesus, who at the very moment of his weakness and humiliation said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. The cross of Jesus shapes everything in the Christian life. And should shape the Christian church. That's why Paul goes on, and this is my last point, don't worry, keep with me. Verses 14 and following. Paul writes, it's not shame. I love that about the Apostle Paul. Paul gets a bad press, do you know that? People think he's a grotchety wee man. Maybe some days he was tempted to be a grotchety wee man. I mean, who could be? But Paul, again, exercises his authority. Not as a tyrant, not as Caesar, not as somebody. I mean, there's nothing worse when people are hurting to go up in their face and say, I told you so, don't we love that, don't we? Yeah. Did you ever have that happen to you? Well, well, if you just listen to me, you'd be all right. <laughs> oh, well, thanks very much. <laughs> Paul could have done that on the Corinthians. I mean, at some points in the letters, he does write with sarcasm, but it's, it's, it's a sarcasm that has a heart behind it. And this is why. He sees the church, not as the world would see them, a collection of warring tribes, but a collection of God's dear children, God's sheep whom God's entrusted to his care and love. You will have countless instructors in Christ. Yeah, you'll have a polish of stuff. You don't have many fathers. I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Therefore, a boy, is this a challenge to me? And this should be a challenge to you, brothers and sisters. I urge you to imitate me. Wow. I had a friend um, who went to university with this guy. And this guy is an engineering student. And you know that engineering students generally don't tend to be the most expressive folks. Sorry if you study engineering. But you know, they're right. To the point. Monosyllabic. But this guy was a committed Christian. And my friend would take young guys to him who wanted to know more about the Christian faith. And so one night these two young guys came to see this engineer. And one was one of these guys who he wasn't very serious, he just he was he was interested in trying all things. So he fired off another question to the engineer and said, Don't have time for you, away you go. My friend was wondering if I was like, oh no. But the second guy said, I what's the difference about Christianity? What makes Christianity different? The engineer should look up and say, come and live with me for a week and watch me. As he lived with the engineer for a week, he saw the reality of prayer in his life. He saw the difference Jesus made in his attitude towards others. Even though he could be quite firm, there was a gracious sweetness. And for that whole week, the student watched how Jesus had made a difference in that one person's life. Did you say that to someone? I'm saying it to myself. Because you see, Paul is going to say the kingdom of God isn't actually taught. Yes, we preach and we proclaim in the good news of Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes with works to that great work of salvation. But that power must be at work within us. That's why I've sent you Timothy. He's my dearly loved and faithful child. He will show you what it's like. He will remind you about my ways in Christ Jesus. Just as I teach everywhere in every church. Now some are arguments if I am not coming to you. But I will come to you soon if the Lord wills. And we will find out the talk. Not the talk, but the power of those who are arguing. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. Just because Jesus was crucified in weakness. Just because he subjected himself to humility to save the world. Does not mean to say that the love of God is a weak and ineffective thing. It would be a fool if we thought that. The power of our God 
restrained by his gracious majesty and love for us as a transforming power that has turned this world upside down countless times through the outpourings of his Holy Spirit. It's a power that transforms our hearts, that lifts us from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light, from despair to hope, from, jo from despair to joy, from hatred to love. It's a power that turns the other cheek. It's a power that loves like Jesus and is shaped like Jesus. That's a power that is evident within us. Just as Jesus said, you cannot hide a light under a bushel, so a real Christian who's got the Holy Spirit powerfully at work within them will be like Jesus and will be different. And they will love, as we'll see in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, with a love that is patient, that is kind, that is gentle, that is good, that doesn't keep any records of wrong, that doesn't bite back, that doesn't rejoice in wrong day, but rejoices in the truth. A love that will not let us go. A love that endures to the end, that goes the extra See how the Gospels come to life in this? The kingdom of God is what Jesus spent the whole Gospels describing what it looked like. The Sermon on the Mount, it's not a prescription, it's a description of what a Christian will look like. To the power of the Holy Spirit. So what is Paul reminding us in 1 Corinthians 4? Don't judge each other. Don't judge. You don't know the hearts, you don't know the intentions. Don't expect God to work the way the world works. Don't try to measure His love the way the world measures it. But measure it through the cross. For how God's work is not always evident to us. And lastly, as a Christian, make sure the power of God is at work within you. But the trip, Paul, it's easy sometimes to drift off. I read one Timothy the other night, or two Timothy the other night. Paul here says he loves Timothy. Timothy's a great lad. Timothy's a good one, he's one of the boys. He comes with his medium flag saying, I'm Timothy. Paul says to him to Timothy, don't forget to stir up the gift of God within you. Don't forget to stir up the gift of God within you. Is your love growing cold for others? Ask the Lord to stir up his love in your heart for others. Do you feel the pressure of the world, the anxieties of the world, and that it's as easy to feel it at the minute with the budgets and the chaos surrounding us? Ask your Heavenly Father to remind you who feeds the birds, the children, the lilies, and the fields. Do you struggle in sharing your faith with others, especially when they're bitter and unkind towards you? <coughs> Look to the cross of Jesus Christ to see the one who at his most weakest was able to say, Father, forgive them, they do not know what they do. Stir up the gift of God to the Muslim church. This East New and this world needs the churches to be like Jesus. And when we're like Jesus, we will see that the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk. A lot of churches are just talk shops. I'm sorry if I offend you, but it's true. We need the power of God in us. And when that power comes, remember this it's not arrogant. It's not puffed up, but it displays itself. And I love this as our closing thought. In love and with the spirit of gentleness. Would to God that the churches of Jesus Christ across this land were known not for their contentiousness, for their ill temper, for their talking, but for their love and their gentleness. Not yet, is it? You can say it again, it's okay. Amen. I'll leave it there. That is prayer. Lord, what the mere preacher feels like to be a spectacle sometimes. And we pray that it was not helpful for me would fall to the wayside. And I mean that, Lord. We pray it every week, but it's true. If there's husks, may they fall down. But what came from you? For we do believe the promises of your word, that your word will go forth and it will not return void. It will do a work. So I ask you in our hearts that you would work your word through. That you would remind us of the truth and the power of our God who is at work in this world through ways we cannot see or imagine that he is at work. And he works sometimes through weakness, through 
don't suspect in people that he is at work. So therefore help us to respond to that. And as your kingdom breaks in and does its establishment, that you would establish in each of our hearts magnitude, the Lord, a spirit of gentleness and of love and of Christ likeness. So that when we gather together as your people, that our services would be marked by the power of the Holy Spirit. And that anyone who comes into them, they would see that this place is different, not because of us, but because Jesus is with us. May this be true for churches across this land this morning, O oh Lord. We desperately need you in this nation of ours. And for those who do not know you this morning, I pray and I hope that something of the beauty and the love and the gracious salvation of our Lord Jesus will be made clear to their hearts through the Holy Spirit, that they would trust in him for their salvation. They'd be filled with the Holy Spirit. They would go forth from this place loved as they've never been loved, filled with a joy unsurpassed. For that is what you do, Lord. We give you thanks for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Sorry, I'll forgot about the meditation. Sorry. As we come to the creature table, we'll just skip the next two songs there. If you're able to stand, please, we'll sing the next two songs as we come around the table together. <laughs>
when you hear a passage like 1 Corinthians 4, it always sounds the way that God sort of dismisses everything we do. It's like, oh wow, is there nothing I could do to please Him? Now this table reminds us what it's all about. We set value in the wrong things. We set and build our lives and wealth, positions of influence, trying to climb up the greasy pole, trying to do this and that. The cross comes and reminds us that our worth even though we rebel against God is in this, that God has loved us with a powerful love that has redeemed us and brings us to himself. And the honour and the glory and the riches we have in life are not because of this world, but because of Jesus Christ, who freely gives us all things in his love. God made us. He created us. We're going to look at that in Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Made us. And even though we rebelled against him, he still sustained us. And he sent his son to show us that we are loved and we're redeemed not with perishable things like gold and silver, but with his precious blood. And the greatest thing we can know in this world is the love of God. Isn't that amazing? Let us pray. Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Saviour's blood? Died he for me who caused his pain? For me who him to death pursued, amazing love, how can it be that thou, you, my Jesus, my God, should die for me? And here is the proof that you did. As we take the bread that reminds us that your body was broken for us. Broken so that we would be made whole. Broken so that the dark rooms of our life and the gloom we have put ourselves into would be overpowered by the light of your presence. <clears throat> the cup which symbolizes your blood shed for us so freely, so graciously from that divine heart. A heart which looked at this rebellious world and had compassion on it. A heart that looked at traitors and didn't say execute them but save them. Heart to give itself without reservation, without qualification, without weighing up the cost because your love was powerful. And so that blood forgives us of our sins freely, completely, and fully. Oh my Jesus, what can we say to you this morning but thank you, Lord, and that we love you. So as you come to this table, brothers and sisters, anyone who loves the Lord Jesus is very welcome. As you come, do the one-way system, come around this way, I'll call you up. Take the bread and the juice back to your seats. And drink it and eat it in remembrance of him. Remember his words in the same night in which he was betrayed. He took the bread and broke it. Give it to his disciples and said, take eat. This is my body which is broken. After he had suffered together, he took the cup, said, Drink this all of you, and this cup is my blood, which is shed for the many, for the forgiveness of your sins. And the Apostle Paul reminds us in Corinthians that every time we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we celebrate, we show forth the Lord's death until he comes. Thank goodness we don't have to wait for a Westminster ballot to give us the King of Kings. He is coming. He loves us. This is not amazing. So please come forward, follow the one-way system, and take communion. There is going to be ones here as well for those who don't want to take from the common car. Please come forward. <coughs>
pray together. Let us pray. <clears throat> For this reason also since the day we heard this, we haven't stopped praying for you. We ask this morning, Lord, that you may fill us with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Help us to walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him. May we bear fruit in every good work and grow in the knowledge of you, O Lord. <coughs> Strengthen us with all power according to your glorious might, so that we may have great endurance and patience with joy. We give thanks to you, Father, for you have enabled us to share with all your saints the inheritance and the glorious light of your Son's kingdom. As we have been reminded at this table, you have rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of your Son, whom you love. Lord, we thank you that you have made redemption, the forgiveness of our sins. We thank you that the one we worship this morning is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords, gracious Jesus. And everything around us was made by you in heaven and earth, whether visible and invisible, thrones or dominions, rulers or authorities, all things have been made through you and for you. And so, Lord, we would pause and pray. We would pray for the government of this nation. Lord, we forgive my cynicism. We do acknowledge that your word says we should pray for those in authority at all. So we would pray this week for whoever the new Prime Minister will be, that you will give them wisdom and diligence to govern a right. And we pray this for all those authorities, for the First Ministers across this land, for the Irish Government, or give them wisdom to govern a right. We continue to pray for the clash of rulers in Eastern Europe. We pray for the people in Ukraine. <coughs> As we see the electrical system destroyed in a very cold winter coming, Lord, we pray for them. We pray your aid and supplies through your churches, through workers and borders. We pray for strength and endurance for those who will be tired and be doing this since February. Lord, as we just pray in your word, may you give them joyful endurance as well to love, to serve, and to keep going. We would pray that you would stop this war, that you would turn Putin's heart to peace and you would rule back all this aggression. We pray for brothers and sisters in Russia as well. It is easy to label them and to dismiss them with the rest of the country, Lord, but that is not right. We pray for our brothers and sisters who are struggling to live and serve faithfully in that land, that you would strengthen them as well. And that they would preach the true gospel of Jesus Christ. We pray for the continued help in Pakistan as they are dealing with the after effects of the floods. Thank you for the work of Barnabas and those on the ground who are selling supplies, helping to rebuild houses, homes and churches. Pray for the situation in Iran. As we hear from our pastors on the ground there, it is tense. <coughs> and the regime is lashing out indiscriminately. Lord, as our brothers and sisters there are persecuted and reviled, may the treasure in their jars of play be powerfully seen. May that lead to salvation of millions in that country. Pray the same for Afghanistan. That is suffering from crippling famines and ruling government problems. Oh Lord, may the eyes of your church not be dictated by the news media, but may we keep our eyes on our brothers and sisters when the news media lose time. So we pray for this world. We thank you, dear, before all things, that you hold all things together. And we pray for those in our midst of this congregation who feel like things are falling apart with health the families, the finances. We feel the pressures of these times, O oh Lord. May you sustain and uphold them. May you be a refuge, a comfort, and a strength to them in all things. You're also the head of the body, the church. We will pray for our own fellowship as we have deacon selections, Lord. That you will bring forth those to serve you, to love you, and to love the people. May your hand be upon that. The next year as the church seeks to find a new pastor, or may you send somebody who loves you and will love them and preach your word and love this area. You're the head of the church. You hold it together. You rise up and you bring down. You send and you send out. In all things, you're the one true constant who will never leave or forsake. So Lord, do your work. 
He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. And through Jesus to reconcile everything to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. As we've already prayed, Lord, we thank you for our salvation. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for filling us with your Holy Spirit and giving us a hope and a joy that is immeasurable. And if we've forgotten that, if that has grown cold, Lord, this morning by your Spirit, revive it in our hearts. Help us not to be alienated and hostile in mind towards you or towards each other. The Christian faith is the ministry of reconciliation. Forgive us for unkind words, for cold shoulders, for harsh thoughts. Oh Lord, help us to love as you have loved and help us to love each other more deeply, more strongly, that this would be a living and effective witness. We thank you that you have reconciled us. And we pray as we go from this place that we have remained grounded and steadfast in the faith, not shifting from the hope of the gospel we have heard. And we thank you that it's still being proclaimed across every country in this world. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I shall be in the kitchen if you want to hurl personal abuse, insults, or give me some money. I don't mind what you want to do. Um, so I'll get the end of the benediction for me. But before I do that, there's one more announcement that I just remembered there as we were praying. There's nothing official yet, so we're just putting feelers out for this, but this week we got an email from Oleg in Moldova. As you know, we've been supporting Oleg with financial gifts, and we thank you for your support, and it's been a tremendous help to them. Oleg and his wife and the ministry guys have been doing this since February. They've been praying, they've been setting up shelters, they've been coordinating the refugees, they've been coordinating the food. And what they have asked is, and we're just throwing it out here, I don't know, maybe we'll discuss it or something in the cafe, if anyone would like to go out to help him for three to six days to help on the ground out there, he would be very, very happy for folk to come out and help. They need helpers just to give them a break, to help folk. It's, there's different things, there, especially ladies, they're looking for ladies as well, um, because there's a lot of refugees who come obviously because the families, the husbands have to stay in Ukraine, and the wives and the daughters are coming themselves, so they need folk to pray with them, so ladies are preferable. So if you're interested in that, think about it, Pray about it. It's something we would like to do as a church. We don't know how yet. We just want to gauge your reaction to that. So they're looking for helpers. Three to six days. Go on out and help them in Moldova. So see myself, Al, or Dave if you're interested in that. Pray about it. And in all things, if you can keep giving us support too financially for them, it's a big help because winter is going to be very difficult right there for them. Did you hear me okay about that? Yeah. yeah. Amen. Let's start and sing our last song. I'm going to run to the kitchen really fast. The years are all here.
together and say the grace. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all in the world. Amen. Enjoy your Sunday, folks. Join us in the cafe for teas and coffees and anything else you can find with you.